Sure. Bond markets that bite. What do you mean by that? Look, what we have to do is rapidly change the global economy. We need to deliver concessional finance. Anything green gets lower across the capital. We need to deliver policies that support the kind of investments that concessional finance will get to. What have we really got to do? We have to have governments and corporations being activists, activists in how they change their whole strategies, how they build green cities, how they build green supply chains. Now, if you're the bond market, we need a bond market that welcomes, embraces, grabs them when they do the right thing and say, I love you, and then bites their nose off if they do the wrong thing. That's what we need. And what's the wrong thing? Well, the wrong thing is the wrong sort of policies. If you've got policies like Australia does right now, which support fossil fuels and positively discourage renewable energy, you need to have be hit by the bond market. Your interest rates are going to go up through the roof because people are going to vote with their checkbooks and say, either give me a much higher risk return on your bonds because we do not believe you are a future fit, or they're going to not get any capital at all. And those people do the right thing. Companies that are shifting towards uh, a green strategy and more to the point countries that are building the right kind of economies for the future get flutter of capital and lower cost capital. So you're the CEO of an organization, Climate Bonds Initiative, which if, if you look at your website, is, is its whole mission is deploying the global bond market, $100 trillion, yep. to tackle climate change. So how, how is that going now? Well, you've got half a trillion now of climate bonds. So there's a few things we're doing. So one is we're trying to prove the point that investors will invest if you give them stuff that meets short-term and long-term requirements. Short-term is they've got to be able to slot into their portfolio. Five-year portfolio management strategies are norm in fixed income land. That's part one. But two is they want something of a bonus feature addresses long-term challenges. That is climate change specifically. That's what a green bond is. Growth, phenomenal. Half a trillion already, outstanding. Three quarters of a trillion by the end of this year. So we're growing fast. And how long did it take to get to the half a trillion? Really, growth started in 2013, and then it's and then went up. It's been helped by regulators in places like China that have decided to push this as a matter of state policy. So where does it need to, where does it need to get to if we're going to get on a Paris sure. pathway? Sure. Well, you know, we're a long way from any real contribution yet. We need to see $3 trillion to $4 trillion of fixed income that we know is going to the right kind of investments, resilience as well as mitigation because we've got a big job in resilience now that we blow in the first half of the climate battle about economies have to be fit now to deal with extreme weather events. So three to four trillion a year. We only about, this year it'll be about 250 billion a year in labeled green bonds. But there's another 250 billion that we can easily call qualifying. We don't really care whether you label it or not. We just want to go to the right places. But investors really like the label. They like the protocol. It's a bit like having a fair trade coffee label. Okay. If that's the case, we will try and label everything for you to make it easy for you to switch into your portfolio, like I said. That's what it's about. It's making it easy for investors. Well, I think, you know, obviously you can tell from your accident you're not a Londoner, but you're in London, and that's no accident, is it? Financial markets or financial centres like London are pretty important. Where would you be? Where else would you be if you were concerned with international capital markets? By far, by far, the largest volume of international capital market flows are in and out of London. So if you're trying to influence international capital markets globally, you've got to be yeah. here. Well, one of the things we're doing with these videos in the next couple of months is promoting the London Climate Action Week. So I think that's probably quite important Indeed. Um, in terms of mobilising that perception. So there's a lot of conversation. One of the things that we talk about um, at Carbon Tracker is brown versus green. You're doing a, a huge amount to mobilise the green. Sure. But how does that impact the brown side of that equation? Because I, I, I always think of it as a simultaneous equation. Brown, you know, maybe I'm simplifying this too much, but brown plus green has to equal, you know, Paris compliance, two degrees. Absolutely. One and a half degrees. But you know, there's a lot to this. So, so going back to what we've accomplished, we've got a large liquid market. It's, we have, as a result, investors piling in. No end of investor demand. Nice win so far. Easy to grow. We've convinced people that green can be that climate change can be a positive investment environment. Green investments will make money over time and will be lower risk than others. It's a big win in the last few years. Until a few years ago, people thought, well, this was a hassle, a burden, a carbon tax, a carbon price, if you like. So, so investments that don't only make moral and ethical sense, they make financial sense. Exactly. Yeah. These at least give you the same return. In the fixed income pays, remember, the issue is capital retention. It's different right. to equities. You just want to make sure you don't lose your shirt. Larry Fink says he didn't make money giving people yield. He made money uh, making sure no one ever lost their money. <laughs> Now, in bond markets, that's exactly what we're doing. We're showing these things won't lose money. In fact, there's now a view that bonds 
that are related to green are like less likely to lose money because those organisations are dealing with risk mitigation or transition. And you now see these very interesting correlations where you get a stock price bounce when people issue green bonds. Or you get a halo effect where all their bonds from that organisation reduce in price, get a better price, once they start issuing a few green bonds as a signalling device. Okay. So this is what's happening in the market. But these are just beginning things. We're also now trying to expand people's understanding of what is involved in green and climate. People started off thinking solar, wind, okay. Mm -hmm. And then we said railways, now that's low carbon. Yeah. Aren't they dirty, railways? No, <laughs> it's trucks that are dirty. Yeah. So we've kind of won that now, and our large slice of the global market is railway bonds or low carbon transit bonds and some electric vehicle. Now we've got to go into the tougher areas. We need to educate people about what are the right kind of investments in steel or in cement. You need ambition, none of this sort of incremental change. But at the same time, there are critical investments to be made that are absolutely commensurate with meeting the Paris Climate Change Agreement. And that's what brown to green is for me. Okay, and why, and why bonds? I mean, some, some of the green atomic viewers may not fully understand the nuances of the financial markets between equities, bonds, infrastructure, and so on. So perhaps maybe just to quickly explain what a bond is and why that's such an important part of this. Sure. Well, first, follow the money. The global bond market is worth $100 trillion US. The global equities market is worth $65 trillion US. This is the big brother on the block. <laughs> Okay. You know, it dominates everything. Well, that's why. Yeah, many people are not aware of that. Not aware of it. Well, it's generally quiet, safe, dominated by actuaries and, and, and uh, accountants, whereas all the equities is dominated by the colourful people. It's brooking deals. So this doesn't get the headlines, but it's where the money really is. Okay. Secondly, it's where the institutional investment money is, which are the big lumps that pay your pension fund or my insurance policy. So they are overweight in bonds. So if you're talking to an insurance company like Allianz, 90% of their investments are in bonds. You okay. can't talk to them unless you're talking bonds. But that's exactly the money that's got to move, which is money that's interested in long-term debt. Now, we need a lot of long-term debt to make this transition. We're funding 20-year infrastructure here. Those guys have got to be mobilized. You don't do bonds, you ain't got a chance. But there's a more complicated reason too. And of course, this is a, now for the first 20 years of discussion around climate investment, it was all about convincing people to take on more risk. Mm -hmm. You know, equity investors, you know, do it for the planet, you know, take a low return and invest in a risky solar yep. plant and lose your money, etc., etc. Actually, that's the wrong way to do it. We're never gonna make really big gains and get the trillions flowing unless we convince people they're not gonna lose their shirt. We need to actually get them investments that will meet their risk yield requirements. That's not gonna be niche solar stocks. That's gonna be big investments that have a similar rating. So if you wanna get something which doesn't get a credit rating now, that can easily slot into an Allianz portfolio, you're gonna to have to do some credit enhancement, some risk mitigation, mm -hmm. which is actually what governments have always done with infrastructure. So the whole point of this game, and one of the reasons we say bonds is, don't bugger around trying to convince me to be riskier. Simply give me stuff that meets my current risk requirements and I'll just slot it in. And you do that by working with governments on risk mitigation. In many ways, you know, it's time has come because you know, a lot of analysis, carbon trackers, other people's analysis, banks' analysis, yep. is showing that we're in an economic tipping point where clean technology is now cost competitive, if not cheaper, than incumbent. In a lot of countries, that's right. Yeah. And we're about to see EVs change core or pass the barrier too. So soon we'll all be buying EVs because this is cheaper. So we're winning on some fronts. But as you know, we've got a lot more fronts to win. Like about 70% of what they have to invest in the next 30 years is urban infrastructure of one sort or another. Okay. At the moment, none of that is ever going to be cost competitive. So this isn't free market stuff here. Yeah. This is about city planning and government planning. We want to find some way to report, re reward cities like Lagos or Sao Paulo or Jakarta who make decisions to improve the life of their citizens that also help reduce emissions for the planet. But they're all longer term. So we've got to get the cost of capital down for them. At the moment, they tend to build a freeway rather than a railway because when you're doing a, a long-term investment, the cost of capital at 8% or 9% is prohibitive. You can't do it. So we've got to get down that cost of capital. And this is where we have a, relate, a partnership that's needed between public sector and development banks who can put in risk pieces right. to make sure cost of capital goes down, and the rich governments who can provide a few selective guarantees to make it cheaper for the mayor or the governor of Jakarta to finance railways rather than freeways. That's the game. So there's a lot of good news, and we're, we're finally, we, you know, we've turned the bad analogy, but we've turned the tanker We're around. turning the tanker, turning. Okay, starting to get pointed in the right direction. 
But it's nowhere near fast enough, is it? I, I heard your call to arms at the Climate Bonds Initiative Annual Conference the other yep. week. Um, but, so why? What, what else is needed now to, to speed this up? Well, let's face it, we need activist governments. So we'd like a few simple things to get people's going. We've got a proposal at the moment that European governments lead a $100 billion green sovereign commitment to get a whole lot to, li- to add an extra liquidity to the market. Simple, cute things to do. We want re- regulators around the world to understand that for financial stability, they have the preference green. The People's Bank of China is doing this right now. The European central banks are certainly wrestling with it. But this is actually now about reducing volatility risk going forward, making this transition fast and smooth. We want a smooth transition. But you know, what we really need is we need governments to understand the scale of what's got to be done and plan. You know, how long have we been talking about reducing emissions out of the agricultural sector in, in Europe. Mm. And yet, we still have a common agricultural policy, not a carbon agricultural policy. We could be hu- doing huge amounts of sequestration in European agriculture, let alone in Brazil or Indonesia, by rebuilding forests and changing our crop use to crops that actually sequester rather than take carbon out of the soil. That's just one area. And I can go through every ministry, and you've got a, p- a strategy like that that has to be adopted. So one thing that is happening, literally this week on Thursday, the European Commission has agreed to a recommendation we made in the High Level Expert Group last year, and they're convening a small coalition of countries and a sustainable finance coalition to try and push aggressive activist governments. China and Europe are the two leaders of that. Yeah. Let's see if we can make that work. Well, I mean, two of the other videos I did in the Green and Tonic series, one was with Olivia Gerson, the Director General of DG FISMA, mm-hmm. who talked about you know, the work of the High Level Group, the HLEG, um, and Europe's Know, plan around green finance, um, but the other was with Dr. Ma Zhu, um yep. from China. So yeah, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. So well, you heard it here first. We need bond markets that bite. That bite. That bite. Um, Sean, thank you. That was a great conversation. Um, please remember to subscribe uh, to the Green and Tonic channel. Um, thank you. <laughs>